So RAM timings are kind of complicated, but also kind of important for overall system performance. So I figured I'd look into it and try my best to explain it as I've come to understand it. So let's get to it. When you see the four numbers on the listing or package or the back of a stick of RAM, those four are known as cast timings. Together they tell you in a kind of an overview as to how long it takes for the RAM to respond to the CPU. The term CAS is an acronym which stands for column address strobe. The first of these four numbers is CAS latency or otherwise known as CL. This is a RAM timing that tells you what speed the RAM stick or kit can respond to the CPU when it tells the RAM it needs some data. The latency of this action is measured in what's called clock cycles. A lower number means it takes less cycles or time, which makes it faster in queuing up the data for the CPU to access. For us to better understand this and the other three cast timings numbers, uh, we kind of have to first talk about RAM frequencies. Now, DDR5 is faster than DDR4 because it has higher frequencies. For instance, 4800 MHz is pretty much the top overclock speed of DDR4 RAM, with 3200 MHz to 3600 MHz being the more common. Meanwhile, that 4800 MHz is the most common base clock or non-overclock speed of DDR5 RAM with top stable speeds up to about 6400 MHz. Though there has been a lot of movement lately in which DDR5 has reached 7200, 8000, 8200 on up to as high as 9000 megahertz. But all these high speeds with DDR5 have a cost, meaning that these kits have a longer cast latency. It's not uncommon for DDR5 memory to have uh, anywhere between CL30 to 36. Uh, sometimes you'll see 26 and 28 as your lower numbers, and you can see 40, 42, and up on your higher numbers. And so the higher the frequency of that RAM, the more likely that CL number is gonna go up with it. Meanwhile, common CLs for DDR4 are around 16 to 20. So as you can see, the higher the frequencies go, the higher the timings numbers will go, thus increasing that latency. The second number in that set of four for cast timings is called row column delay or TRCD. This number shows how long the RAM takes to read data. The third number is called row precharge time or TRP. This number shows how long it takes for a new row of data to be readied or pre-charged. The fourth number is called row active time or TRAS. And this number shows the minimum amount of time needed for an active row to respond. So in other words, if I'm understanding it all correctly, the CPU calls for some data. The CL is the response time to that call for that data. If that data is active, the TRCD reads that data to confirm it is the correct data being called for. If it's not, then the TRP will call for a new row of data. If it is the correct data, the TRAS will then set the minimum time for that row of data to remain active for pre-charging or access. Of course, if you think I'm misunderstanding or have the order incorrect of what's going on, uh, please comment down below since, you know, I'm, I'm not 1000% on it myself. So what does all this mean for gaming and productivity? Well, that's what we're here to find out. So now we're going to run some tests and show you the results. First, we're going to test a kit of DDR5-6000 with a CL28. Then we'll test the exact same system with a kit of DDR5-6000, but with CL36. We'll test them in games, in productivity, and in synthetic benchmarks. Then we're going to test two CPUs that are fairly close together in overall performance, 
with one platform using DDR4 with a 3950X. And the closest CPU I could find to this was a 13600KF with a kit of DDR5. Um, tell me in the comments if you know another CPU that's closer in overall performance to the 3950X. Uh, this is the best one I thought I could find at with the time I had available. All right, and for this test, we're going to set the DDR5 kit to its base clock speed. So in other words, uh, 4,800 megahertz. So we can get as close to the DDR4 frequency and see how the difference in CL timing performs. Then we'll reset the DDR5 kit to its OC speed. We'll end up running the exact same tests. This should give us an idea of the differences in CL timings and the frequencies in performance. We'll use the exact same SSD and the exact same GPU on all the tests. All right, so let's get started. The rig that I used for the benchmarks uh, was the RTX 4090 with the Ryzen 7 9800X 3D. PBO was turned off. For the SSD, I used a Crucial T705 NVMe. The motherboard, uh, I used the MSI X870E Carbon. The power supply was the Rosewell 1200 watt, 80 plus gold. And the CPU cooler was the Peerless Assassin 120SE. Also, I found a kit that I had that had 6,000 megahertz, but a CL38 instead of a CL36. So I thought having these two CL numbers further apart would make for a more interesting test result. And the two kits that I used was the 32 gig G-Skill Trident Z5 Royal Neo, 6,000 megahertz, CL28, 363696 were the rest of the timings. And to compare it, I used another 32 gig kit from Team Group T-Force Vulcan, 6,000 megahertz. This had timings of CL38, 38, 38, and 78. For the Cyberpunk 2077 benchmark tool, uh, we're at the Ultra Preset, scaling's off, no RT. And as you can see, not a huge difference here between the two kits. So at 1080p, we're at 225 and 222, so a difference of three frames. So plus 1.5% gain for the CL28 kit at 1080p. And we lose 1.3% of performance on 1440p at 151 versus 153, and we gain 4% of performance in 4K at 76 versus 73. And a lot of this, as you can probably guess, is really run variance more than anything else from what I can tell. And you'll see what I mean as we go on. So the next gaming benchmark I used was the Black Myth Wukong benchmark tool. It says ultra preset here, but what they call it is, it's, it is an ultra preset set but they call it very high scaling's at minimum because you can't turn it off uh, it was the tsr that i used and no rt and as you can see we got the exact same results all across the board for both kits at 1080p at 1440p and at 4k then i used the Firmark benchmark version 2.4.3.0 and I test at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. For 1080p, I get the exact same results and at 1440p, I got a plus 0.3% gain on the CL28 kit at 329 frames a second versus 328. And at 4K, I lost a half a percent at 195 versus 196 frames. Then I used the Blender benchmark tool. Uh, Blender version was 4.4.0. On the CPU side, when you test just the CPU, I've got zero gain. The exact same results on Monster, Junk Shop, and Classroom. When I test the GPU, not a whole lot of difference there either. So I've got a plus 0.1% gain on Monster. I lose 0.8% performance on Junk Shop, and I lose 0.3% performance in Classroom. Kind of an interesting result there, but mostly uh, I'm 
assuming it's run variants more than anything because the number differences are so low. Then I ran Cinebench R23 to see how the CPU would perform, if it would perform any different, and not really all that different. So we've got on multi-core score, we have a minus 0.3%, and on single core, we have a minus 0.1% of performance. It, it is interesting, though, that uh, the CL38 kit is slightly edging out the CL28 kit, even though it might be a ROM variance thing. It is kind of interesting. Then I did a, a export test on a 20-minute video and a 5-minute video. Both of these videos had the exact same filters put on it. There's like five or six different filters I put on it uh, just to give it a little more hard of a time for it to process and render and uh, as you can see here again the CL38 kit is slightly outperforming the CL28 kit in this uh, particular test. I'm losing performance at minus 0.6% on the 20 minute video export versus the other kit and I'm losing a whopping 8.3% of loss on the five minute video export. So that is not a run variance right there. And then I ran the OCCT benchmark, uh, the memory benchmark. I used version 13.1.14. And as you can see, pretty much a uh, run variance thing, except for on the read speeds. The read speed, I gained about 3.2% performance for the CL28 kit versus the CL38 kit. And then I lose 0.6% of performance on the write speed, and I gain only a 0.1% performance on the combined speeds, which kind of pretty much confirming the performance that we saw on all the other benchmarks. All right, those are the results. And so before we talk a little bit more about those results, uh, I wanted to talk about why I decided not to do the 3950X with DDR4 versus 13600KF with DDR5. I figured the two different generations of platforms might affect the overall performance, and so it might have ended up with a lopsided kind of results and maybe an unfair comparison. Uh, but more importantly, I couldn't find a 4800 MHz kit of DDR4, so all I've got on hand is 3600 MHz kit. And so even at the base clock on the DDR5 being at 4800 MHz, I thought that might turn into kind of a lopsided results. And I wanted to remove as much of the variances as I possibly could to do a fair comparison for just the timings. I decided not to do that for this particular video. If you want me to do a video like that, uh, I can probably locate some 4800 megahertz DDR4 kits. And so if you want me to do something like that to compare uh, timings for DDR4 versus DDR5 and what kind of performance differences there are, given that the frequencies are the same between the two kits, then write down in the comments for me and let me know that you want me to do that. And I'll, I'll take a look into that. Meanwhile, let's talk about the results. So the, the, the results weren't all that impressive as far as differences go. Uh, they're pretty close together. And uh, I found that kind of interesting, but I also found it kind of justified a previous video I did, the different frequencies that I was testing out and the different workloads, right? I was doing gaming workloads and productivity workloads and testing out different kits and different frequencies and came to find out that not a lot of difference. As a matter of fact, it made no sense to buy anything beyond the 6,000 megahertz frequency. And it looks like we're kind of finding the same thing with these results in that uh, the 6,000 megahertz at CL28 or CL30 are, is, is kind of kind of the sweet spot, I think, uh, and still is considering I used modern gear for these tests. I started wondering why the performance between the two uh, CL numbers were kind of pretty much neck and neck. I mean, 
we're, we're talking about maybe about like a 30% difference between the uh, cast latency of the one kit versus the other. Taking a closer look, and I'll call up the, the picture here to show it to you. Taking a look at the rest of the timings, it looks like the main difference in timings other than the cast latency is in the TRAS or the fourth number in the timings. The CL28 kit had 96 for the TRAS number. The CL38 kit had 78 on, on that number. And so maybe that has something to do with the performances being so close together. Uh, I'm not sure. Bottom line is, is that if we took an average of all the numbers that we came across on these tests, we're, we're not seeing very much of a difference. If I had to give advice to people as to what frequencies and what cast latencies that they want from a cost-effective standpoint, dollar-for-dollar dollar standpoint, and overall performance standpoint, I'd have to go with the 6,000 megahertz CL28 or CL30. I wouldn't even be looking at like the 7200, the 8200, the 9,000 megahertz. Those things are going to cost an arm and a leg, probably somewhere between two and three times the amount for very little if no uplift in performance. Right, so hopefully you enjoyed this information, found it interesting. Uh, and if you did, please hit that like and subscribe button down at the bottom. It helps out the channel a ton. And if you got any questions or comments or anything, feel free to uh, write them down in the comments and I'll respond to them as soon as I see them. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one.